It's been a long time since the heavyweight division has had two giants like this, two champions at the top of their game. I'm a king in my city. Every jig in the style. Low mama on the drive. She drew me up like go, go. She drew me up like go, go. Who said money can't buy happiness? All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Brooklyn Boxing Podcast. I am joined by Lou DeBella. Thank you for joining me today. I'm excited to have you. Um, thanks for joining. My pleasure. Awesome. I've been doing a lot of talking over this pandemic to keep myself occupied. So <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to talk to a new face and a new voice. So. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, you know, you're, you're full of stories, so many years in the business. Um, so I'm so excited uh, to give my listeners and viewers um, some time with you today. So um, before we jump into um, your background and, and kind of your start in boxing that I definitely want to get into, I think it's super important to kind of just touch on um, what's currently going on in boxing um, with the recent announcement of Tyson versus Roy Jones Jr. Um, there's so much noise about it, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the fight even taking place um, first off. First of all, I, I'm going to really go with the, the company line that this, this is an exhibition. Uh, you know, I question whether they're going to be trying to take their heads off. I don't know what the size of the gloves are. I heard they're wearing headgear. You know, both of these guys are friends. You know, I know them forever. And here's why it's happening. And people don't want to accept this or understand it. But there's a great line in that last Rocky movie, ba Rocky Balboa, that I was in. Uh, and the line was simply when, when Rocky's kid is all over him about why he's coming back, Rocky just says, fighters fight, fighters fight. And that's what fighters know how to do. And, you know, you know that one of my best friends in boxing is a guy that I worked with his whole career. I think he's a future Hall of Famer, Sergio Martinez. Sergio's coming back in Spain in a couple of months. And it might even be weeks. I don't even know the exact date, but I think it's a couple of months. But he came to me and he said, Lou, you want to be involved in the fight? I said, no. I said, Sergio, I really want you to stay retired. He said, I got to do this for me. I'm going to do it. I got to do it for me. If you want some involvement, I'll be happy to give it to you. If not, then just send me a letter releasing me of, of our contract and let me do this on my own and tell me that I have your blessing. And he's my friend. So he's got my blessing. I mean, if he feels like he needs to do this, then he's going to do it. And he's a grown-ass man. There's nothing I could do to stop him if the athletic commissions aren't going to stop him. I sort of feel the same way about Tyson and Roy. I mean, if they feel they need to do this and it's an exhibition, I don't love it. I question whether it should be happening. In a weird way, I think it's an indictment to boxing because the biggest names fighting right now on the schedule in the fall are Tyson and Roy Jones. And un unfortunately, I, I don't think our sport, you know, we've spent nearly a billion dollars in boxing in the United States over the last three years. And I would argue strenuously that the, that the, the business is not in any better shape now than it was three or four years ago. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what my next question was going to be regarding this, this situation is kind of what this means for boxing in general. You look at the undercard of this fight and you got Jake Paul, who's a YouTuber. Fight. Okay, but it's not a fight. Like, I, I view the whole thing as, a, 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 as a, a, you know, a goof. I mean, I met Jake Paul and Logan. I actually got along with them. I was in Florida. I met them. I thought Jake, Jake and I had some conversations. I thought he was a decent guy. He I mean, he's, 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 a, he's an internet star. And, right. he's, he, and he's a bit of like a, he's a little bit wacky and he constantly gets in trouble, but he's get, he gets a gazillion views. So their hope is, is to, you know, cause these new markets to jump in. Everyone knows Tyson, everyone knows Roy, and then to bring in these internet dudes and see if you can do business. I get it. I view the whole show as, I view the whole show as not boxing. I view the whole show as an exhibition. I, I don't care about it much one way or the other. I wish... Mike and Roy well, because I like Mike and Roy. But I'll tell you, I mean, I thought the Showtime schedule was decent for the fall. You know, I thought the pay-per-views might be marginal as pay-per-views. I love, actually, the doubleheader pay-per-view, like the Charlo one that's yeah. broken up into three fights in the day and three fights a night for one price. I thought that was really innovative thinking and creative, and I liked it. 
I love the Charlo Derevinchenko fight as a boxing fan. I, you know, I truly, 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 truly believe Sergey Derevinchenko got robbed against Triple G. He won that fight. And I actually thought he had a draw with Danny Jacobs when they fought at the theater at the Garden. You know, it was a flash knockdown that let them give the decision to Danny. But, I mean, I think Sergey easily right now could be undefeated. And, and, um, and I think Charlo Derevinchenko is anybody's fight. I also like the other fight. Uh, what's the kid's Rosario? name? Uh, what? Is it Rosario? Yeah, Rosario and the other Charlo. Yeah, I, I think those are two good fights. I'm looking forward to that card. If if the Danny if if Danny um, uh, Garcia uh, really gets announced with Errol Spence for a pay per view this fall, that's good. That's really intriguing fight to me. Uh, yeah, I mean, particularly. I mean, I'll buy that one with Spence coming right back into a, into the ring if he comes back against a guy like Danny. But I mean, it looks like there's some interesting stuff coming, and, and we'll see. But you know. It, I, there's going to be a lot of attention to that Tyson exhibition. Yeah. I mean, there's, everyone's going to watch it. I mean, it's Tyson. He's returning. I, I just watched a recent interview of his um, and they kind of touch on that exact thing that you were talking about in terms of how hard are they really going to be going? You know, I, I think it's still kind of. <laughs> Look, here's my theory. Okay. I'm not sure a guy in his mid fifties who smokes more weed than I do should be fighting. Okay. But but if he is, God bless him. And, and I'm, you know, it's, again, I, 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 I don't think either one of them is going to get hurt, God willing. And, uh, and it, you know, they're grown men. They're allowed to make their own decisions. Yeah, of course. Um, and, and another kind of interesting thing that I wanted to get your perspective as a promoter um, that Tyson is kind of launching through this fight is he's starting this new series or legend series or league, he's calling it where he's going to bring in athletes um, from all different sports that are retired, like that still have a big name and find ways for them to compete again, whether it's uh, he mentioned like getting Dennis Rodman or Allen Iverson, guys like that to play in one-on-one -on -one games um, just to get old stars. Back. You know, I, I love the concept and I think Mike has become a compelling character. I love the transformation of Mike Tyson into this lovable guy that the whole world likes. And I think Mike, I give him incredible credit for turning his life around and for making himself into such a likable, um, you know, accessible guy. And, and, and I'm a big Mike Tyson fan. You know, I'm a, I'm a big, big Mike Tyson fan. I think the idea is cool. And I think Mike's enough of a celebrity to help it, it work. But here's the difference between boxing and one-on-one -on -one basketball or boxing and two old men in a home run hitting contest or, or boxing and two guys practicing their slap shots on the ice. <laughs> you could hurt someone boxing. You're yeah. hitting another guy in the head. You're hitting someone else. Uh, I'm a little bit more concerned about combat sports for older guys than I am the overall concept that Mike's working on. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, especially with a guy like Tyson, one, his, his mindset based off of recent interviews he seems like he's like hey Roy's gonna have to deal with what I with what I bring meaning like you know he's not gonna be well meaning meaning in the words of Mike Tyson you gotta bring ass to get ass <laughs> and and a guy like Tyson too at the heavyweight division like obviously he's got tremendous power and that's one of the last things that leaves guys when they get older right I mean it's not necessarily it, you know people are gonna think I'm crazy but I said this years ago when Roy beat Ruiz years ago and won the title and Mike was out there. I told people I thought that if, got, if they got in the ring that I would make it 80-20 that Roy would have beaten them. And I think Roy would have outboxed them and Mike wouldn't have landed a knockout punch. Roy was almost unhittable in his prime. Like right. in that moment of his prime. And Tyson was not the same fighter already by, by the, by the mid-90s. So um, back then I would have picked Roy but now, if they had no headgear and the gloves were the same size, I'd be pick, picking Mike. Because yeah. power power is the last attribute in my mind to go. Right. Yeah, I think uh, headgear, it's kind of still gray area. I don't know if they're doing that or not. But I've heard Headgear, really though, doesn't really pre prevent the knockout. People don't understand uh, that. Yeah. He headgear prevents a cut. Yeah. So the, the headgear thing doesn't make me think. I'm more wondering about the size of the gloves. You I know? heard small bounce. Still could get knocked out. Someone could still yeah. get knocked out. Right. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting. Um, 
I hope the benefit is just more people are watch, obviously going to be watching boxing and boxing is more in the news, I think. So I think that's kind of the silver lining. More people are paying attention, hopefully. Um, I know that's kind of what your viewpoint was a little bit, right, with the Mayweather-McGregor thing in terms of just getting I had – look, I, I went to the Mayweather. Floyd and I are still friendly. We have a good relationship. He sent me two tickets back when Al Heyman and Floyd sent me two tickets to go to the Conor McGregor fight. I never had a problem with that. It was, it was what it was. It was, an, it, it was, you know, glorified sparring session for Floyd, but there were a lot of people that bought into Conor's chances. And by the way, even though, in my mind, Floyd, Floyd could have ended that fight at any time, Conor was much better than I thought he was going to be. But, but from the standpoint of... of people who wanted to be entertained. There was a great demand for it. And, and you know what? It is what it is. Like, don't make more out of something than it is. If people wanted to see that, fine. I, I would like to see, uh, you know, Amanda Nunez fight Claressa Shields. I would like to see, I wouldn't mind seeing, you know, Connor fight a, a lesser fighter than Floyd and see what he could do. If, if there's enough of a demand to it, to justify the economics, I'm okay with it. I like that a lot better than watching like two inter two guys from or social media influencers, <laughs> where I could come off a fucking I could come off my fucking couch at 60 years old and beat the shit out of either one of them. I mean that doesn't interest me very much. Yeah. But but I mean I'm not you know like McGregor and, and Mayweather was a spectacle. Yeah. No and and. Uh... Yeah, I appreciate your take on that. So to kind of backpedal a little bit, you know, I just wanted to touch on Tyson right away because I thought, you know, it just came, news just came out. So I wanted to hear what you thought. But um, let's uh, circle back to kind of your beginnings in boxing. I know you grew up in Brooklyn, born in Brooklyn. Um, Tufts, Harvard background, obviously very well educated business-wise, everything like that. And then sort of tell the people what, brought you to boxing the business of boxing well i mean start with the fact i'm a six-year-old kid and the two sports i'm a diseased fan of going back to when i could barely walk and talk were boxing and baseball so those are my first two loves and now i'm you know managing partner of two double a minor league baseball teams the montgomery biscuits and the richmond flying squirrels um and boxing obviously i've had a, i've had a pretty good run um you know, if, if there would have been an induction this summer, I would have been inducted into the, the Hall of Fame. And that, that, that's obviously a nice recognition of, uh, of 30 plus years in the business. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember watching Nino ben Benvenuti fights with my grandparents when I was a little kid on like Wide World of Sports and stuff. And Ali like just transfixed me from the time I could remember. He was my like first sports hero in boxing, and Benvenuti and Ali. And um and I never stopped. My, my love for Ali carried me through. And, and, I, and, and, and I, it does, it, I knew so much about boxing before I started working in the sport. It's, it, it, it's almost like it was destined, sort of. And interestingly, I got the job at HBO Sports as um, the lawyer for HBO Sports. And then eventually I took over the boxing program. I reported to Seth Abraham, but I ran the boxing program for over a decade at HBO. Yeah. Um, I was interviewing for a job to be the chief lawyer for the New York Yankees. And that was 1989. And, um, and I went through this whole series of interviews with Yankee brass. I remember a guy named Arthur Richmond, who was a big executive at the Yankees. And I interviewed with him and I interviewed with a couple other Yankee executives and they loved me. And I was a huge baseball fan. And um, I was getting called in for a final interview where three of us, I think were going to meet with George Steinbrenner. And he was going to select one for the job. I got up the, that morning. I took the day off from the law firm I was working at. I had my suit on. I had my resume in my pocket. My, my, my cell phone I was carrying. And back then, the cell phones were like 20 pounds. <laughs> and, um, and I was supposed to go up to the Bronx. And literally a half hour before I left my, um, my apartment, I get this call from George Steinbrenner's secretary. And she's like, all sheepish. And she's like, Lou, I know you had this interview scheduled. I know you probably took the day or the morning off, but um, the boss changed his mind. He's eliminating you because he thinks you're too young. And I was still in my 20s. And I guess I was, the, the other guys who were interviewing for the job had me by 
a few years in experience. And Steinbrenner decided he wasn't hiring some guy in his 20s to be his general counsel. So then I think the lady felt so badly for me, who was his secretary. She's like, I don't know if this helps you, but like one of the other two guys that's going to be interviewing for this was also interviewing to be the head lawyer for HBO Sports. And I think he's going to get the job here. So maybe that'll mean that the HBO job's open if you're interested. As soon as I heard HBO, I heard boxing. And I knew that job was for me. And I literally left my apartment right that moment. Instead of going up to the Bronx, I walked from my apartment to the HBO building. Back then, it was before 9-11 by about 10 years. So I, I just snuck right past the security guards. And I went up and I, and I, I charmed the, law, the chief lawyer at HBO, the general counsel of HBO. I charmed the secretary into introducing me to the, the chief lawyer. The, the guy thought I had such big balls to sneak in to talk to him that he invited me into his office. And he told me, well, we're about to hire this other dude. And I'm like, well, you're going to hire the wrong fucking guy. And he goes, well, that's pretty cocky. Like, why are you saying that? I go, because, well, I went to Harvard Law and my grades were good. And I was top of my class at Tufts University. And I went to Regis High School, by the way, high school of Dr. Anthony Fauci. Um, and I said, I got a great resume, but nobody you interviewed knows more about boxing than me. I will guarantee you that no one knows more about boxing than me. So he, he started laughing. He chatted with me for like a half hour. And then he sent me up to Seth Abraham's office. And Seth and I were both two kids from Brooklyn. And, you know, he's a Jewish kid from Brooklyn. I'm an Italian kid from Brooklyn. We both love boxing and baseball. We spent a lot of time talking about baseball that day. And then when we started talking about boxing, you know, I think Seth will be the first to tell you that it became clear to him that I knew more about boxing than he did. <laughs> and, um, and that was Friday afternoon. And Monday morning, I got a job offer to work at HBO Sports. And I took a huge pay cut. I took a pay cut of like one third of what I was making. I was a hot young lawyer at a big, big firm, Sullivan and Cromwell. I was making really good money. But I took a pay cut, like I took one third of my previous salary. But thank God, like my rise at HBO was pretty quick. So was the rise of my money at HBO. And I had a nice run there until I told the chairman of HBO in, in uh, the summer of 2000 to go fuck himself. And, uh, and, and then I had to, uh, you know, I, 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 I was, uh, you know, I, I, I worked out a separation package and I left HBO and started my own company. But starting my own company allowed me to acquire baseball teams, allowed me to start a production company, allowed me to act, yeah. and, you know, mess around in, in that area. I produced another number of documentaries. I was an associate producer of The Fighter. I got to do some fun things. I got to have a real career in baseball. So I think that you know, leaving HBO when I did was probably the best thing for everybody involved. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple things that stand out to me just from, you know, you kind of telling that story of you're getting into HBO and, um, you know, I definitely want to talk about Boxing After Dark. Um, but before that, I'd like to bring back Boxing After Dark. I'd like someone to give me a series where I could go out there and I'll go to every promoter that's not named Eddie or Bob or or Al, and I'll go to every promoter to make the best fights and see what I can do. Give me a Boxing After Dark series on some network or some streaming service and see what I can do with a fraction of the money that's being spent right now. Yeah, and Lou, maybe give like the people watching that maybe aren't overly familiar with Boxing After Dark and really what it brought. You know, it brought before Boxing After and, Dark, before yeah. Boxing After Dark, you didn't see featherweights on TV. Forget about flyweights. Forget about the little guys. Boxing After Dark opened the doors for all the lower weight classes. It also opened the doors for fighters that were undefeated or, or just top-level guys, even if they had a loss or two, who were willing to fight each other, where we could get the, big, the, the, the matchups, that, every matchup for years on Boxing After Dark in the 90s was a competitive matchup, literally. You had upsets all over the place. You had World War Threes all over the place. I mean, guys like Kevin Kelly, Marco Antonio Barrera, Kennedy McKinney, Junior Jones, Orlando Canizales, um, Nassim Hamed. I mean, all these guys yeah. had, you know, danced through Boxing After Dark at some point. And Boxing After Dark built a lot of stars. Arturo Gatti was probably the biggest star of Boxing After Dark over its years of a run. Um, 
you know, I, I'm very proud of, of Boxing After Dark, and it's sad to me that HBO is out of the business. I, I actually tried to reach out to HBO in the last six months during this pandemic to see if they would let me acquire the name to try to take a series elsewhere if they didn't want to do it. But uh, I didn't get much of an answer. Yeah, I mean, I think boxing is really yearning for something like that. Um, I think it lacks in promotion um, on that level. Um, and, you know, I've had conversations with, um, hopefully I didn't, oh, okay, I thought I lost you there for a second, but all good. So um, I had a previous interview with uh, Fernando Villegas, uh, HBO producer, guy who was heavily involved with the 24-7 series, the first one with uh, De La Hoya and Mayorga. And, you know, he talked a lot about how, um, the promotional side and, and the backstory they created for Mayorga was really, you know, instrumental in, in getting that fight to be a big pay-per-view buy or, or big views on that fight. And um, you know, Yeah, but the, look, the biggest difference between then and now wasn't telling the stories or wasn't the performance of promoters. The biggest difference is I would never allow an exclusive deal when I was at HBO. And in fact, Showtime, when I was running HBO Sports, we're not running HBO Sports, Seth Abraham was. When I was running HBO Boxing, um, Don King had almost an exclusive at Showtime. But I kicked the fuck out of him. I was destroying what Showtime was doing because I was able to work with everybody else and make the best matchups where Don was only working in his own universe. Well, now you have Al working in his own universe and you have Eddie working in his own universe and you have, uh, you know, um, Heyman in his own universe and with ESPN on their Avenue, PBC on their Avenue with Showtime and Fox, the zone on their Avenue fighters aren't crossing over very often. So you're not getting the best product. Right. And honestly, bad boxing is a shitty product. Good boxing is the best combat sports product on earth. A good, there is nothing like a great heavyweight fight. There's nothing like a great, like World War Three blood and guts fight like a Gaddy Ward, you know? And there's nothing, you know, better than great science in the old days when you had a Pernell Whitaker, you know, fighting a Chavez or stuff like that. I mean, boxing is tremendous, tremendous programming when you have great matches with the outcome in doubt. But when you're watching, you know, fights that are meant to be appearance fights and showcases. Like, I don't enjoy having announcers scream at the top of their lungs telling me that I'm supposed to be excited because a great, a great prospect or a great fighter defeated a very pedestrian opponent. That's all bullshit. Yeah, the fans aren't dumb either. I mean, they're able to recognize what they're watching. And, you know, as we mentioned, there's going to be some, some marquee matchups on the way, hopefully in the fall. Um, but what do you think for, you know, the future of boxing? Are you hopeful that um, these promotions and networks will kind of come together at some point and almost... They're not coming together. No, they're, they're not coming together. No. I mean, well, the zone needs to establish its, yeah. its subscriber base worldwide for their global app. I don't know what's going to happen. I think the zone USA will continue to, to be doing shows, obviously, but I don't know where that's going to go in the long run. But I know that the zone is turning its attention more to the launch of the global app. They're not going to be looking to help ESPN right. or PBC. I mean, I think Heyman has free TV. I think that's a big advantage. He also has Showtime right now, pretty much a corner on their championship boxing. Um, ESPN is top rank. Um, no, yeah. I, don't, I don't think they're going to – I think they all have their own concerns. And right now, because of all the months that were lost, they have obligations to a lot of fighters. And we're in really difficult times where a lot of fights are falling out. And we don't know what the fall is going to bring. I don't expect them to cross over each, you know, the street very often to make the biggest and best fights in the foreseeable future or not. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of tough to see as for a fan, like obviously you, you would hope that in the future um, you could kind of get rid of the alphabet soup a little bit with all the belts. <laughs> you, you could get rid of the alphabet soup right now, but the alphabet soup suits the interest of these people. They have right. three separate avenues. So if you have six champions in a weight class, it's more belts for them to distribute between themselves. And all the other promoters are fucked because not only do you not have an out, not only do all the other promoters not have an exclusive deal, they no longer have the ratings organizations protecting up and coming quality fighters. The ratings organizations now are looking to make money with the exclusive deals that exist in the marketplace. So the whole fucking business is pretty much corrupted 
to an extent, and you're not getting the biggest and best fights. But you know what? For a while, this is going to be the status quo, and I got to just try to do business with everybody. And to go back to your experience with the Yankees, uh, and obviously the Yankee Stadium has a history of boxing. Um, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> but the uh, – you see boxing – Hey, Topi, shh, shh, shh. Be a good girl. Be a good girl. Sorry. Do, you, do you see boxing ever returning to Yankee Stadium? Um, you never say never. Could the next Mike Tyson emerge and capture the imagination of the American public? Is there some fight that can get built to big, big enough that it might go back to a stadium situation? Maybe someday. Right now, no. Right now, we got to be worried about whether we're going to get fans in big arenas in the next year. Yeah, I mean, I know they've been talking a little bit rumored about Raider Stadium, right, for the trilogy with um, Fury and, and Wilder. I don't believe that fight will happen in 2020. I don't give a fuck what anyone says. I don't believe it. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be a stretch to imagine that that would happen. <laughs> They're not forcing a fight like that into a situation with no site revenue. I don't believe it. Mm -hmm. and, and a stadium fight is likely – And by the, way, by the way, one of the things that's come out of this pandemic – are more stupid rumors, idiotic discussions, and and bad predictions. And and I think everybody's just got to be a little bit realistic and figure where we are. And and right now we're in a, we're in the middle of a shit show in this country. And let's hope for the best in terms of all the sports for the remainder of the year. Definitely. Well, let's focus on a couple of those fights that we talked about earlier: Derevchenko and Charlo. I think, like you said, it's a tremendous matchup. I just want to. I I really, really, really hope. Look, one of the things I've noticed from those little ESPN shows so far is that the A-sides with no crowd are even getting more of the benefit than they did before when there were crowds. I don't want to see Derevchenko get ripped off again if he wins. If Charlo beats him, God bless him. He's one of the best middleweights in the world. But, but, but I think Sergey could win the fight. But I, I just am really hoping that it'll be the best judges available, that the judge is going to be instructed to call the fight as they see it, and it's not going to be in the bag for the A-side. Because um, I do think that Derevchenko, with a fair shake, with a fair shake, Derevchenko can win that fight. And where, where would you see the winner of that fight going? I mean, I know Canelo's kind of floating around, and he seems to be, you know, everyone's got the target on him as that big money fight. I think that that's possible. I think they could also, one of the 54-pounders could come up you know, there's also Andrade out there if the money's good enough. Um, you know, there, you know, the, the, there's, uh, you know, obviously C C Canelo's the 800 pound gorilla, but he's really more of a. I, I don't know that Canelo's ever going to go back to 160. I tend to doubt it, actually. You think he'll stay at 168? I, I tend to think so, or you know, 68, 75. I mean, you know, I would also think he'd stay at 68 even if they make the deal for Triple G because it's much more of an advantage to Canelo not to have to shrink down to 60. And, and as much as I respect Triple G, I think he's going to get his ass kicked in the third fight. Yeah, I've had some discussions about that trilogy with some, some other friends, and, and um, I'm not even sure if I really want to see that trilogy, honestly, at this point. Um, I know he'll still get buys, but, um, you know, said Triple G against Derevchenko, he didn't look – he didn't look like himself at all. He lost that fight. I mean, he lost seven. I watched that fight about 10 times, and I, saw, I scored it the same way every single time. And I thought that Derevchenko won by a couple of points. And I, and they were, I mean, and by the way, when you looked at the two of them after the fight, you, know, you, you sort of knew who won. And I also think when you looked at Triple G's face in the ring, and I think Triple G's one of the most stand-up guys in boxing, when you looked at his face in the ring, I don't think he thought he won. No. And um, a couple other guys – um, Tevin Farmer and, and Regis Progress, you know, two great fighters coming off of a loss, um, but obviously still very much in that championship picture, top contender level fighters, world-class guys. What do you see next for them? Um, or if you can give us any news in terms of, you know, plans for them. Um, I think Regis will get back, back, should be back in the ring, you know, by the fall. Um, I expect something to, to be announced with him in, in, in fairly short order. Um, Tevin has a contract to fight Jojo Diaz in a rematch. Um, I would hope it would be for the IBF title again. Um, I think it could be if Jojo and, and Golden Boy can, can get on the same page and we can get a deal done. I mean, we, were, we already have a contract for the rematch. 
So it's really JoJo being ready to fight and getting the thumbs up and the date from uh, from the zone. But we have a contract for for Tevin to fight JoJo Diaz, and, and I'm, I'm assuming that Tevin will fight JoJo Diaz before the end of the year. Yeah, and that was a great first fight. I think, um, you know, Tevin looked like the – I don't know if it was the weight cut or, or what the issue was, but it seemed like in the first matchup his legs uh, were not with him that night. It seemed a little – sluggish and maybe not as, as as fast as he usually is i don't know if um that's something you would agree with or he's just no, he, he, he definitely had a very difficult night and um maybe more will be discussed about that in the future but he definitely had a very difficult night but i think he's okay now he's ready to come back and i think he's ready to beat jojo diaz and i think it's a real good fight again when it happens and you think that's possible for the fall i would hope by the end of the year yeah end of the year mm-hmm Awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a great matchup. I think it's going to be another tremendous fight. So, um, you know, that's another, that's another great fight to look forward to. Right. I mean, I'm working on a really big fight right now in New Zealand, um, which would be one of the biggest matchups in the history of New Zealand boxing and the history of the heavyweight division in New Zealand between Joe Parker and junior Fa. So I've been talking to David Higgins who has represents Joe Parker and we've been negotiating for the last week or so. Um, New Zealand has almost no cases of coronavirus. They have a real good That's leader there, yeah. unlike our country. They don't have a fucking orange moron running their country. And the lady that runs New Zealand's done a terrific job, but their borders are pretty much shut off. If Joe Parker wants a big fight in New Zealand this year, he's going to have to fight one of my guys, either Joe, either Junior Fa or Hemi Ahio. And um, um, I've been negotiating with Parker's people to see if we can get that done. And hopefully that, you know, I think that they're looking at an October date potentially for the fight. So I want to see if we can get something done in the next week or so. And you'd be able to do a stadium show or would that be? Yeah. I mean, I don't know that I'd be there. I mean, I, I don't know what's going to be the travel restrictions. Who knows? I, I certainly put it this way. If New Zealand's closing, if New Zealand's got its borders shut down right now. I'd be surprised if they would let, let anybody in from the shit show, which is our country. So, uh, so my, my, my guess would be, I couldn't even get over there, but, um, uh, it would be a stadium show. It would be a pay-per-view show in New Zealand. Um, Junior beat him twice in the amateurs. So it's a, it's a big, big fight over there. Yeah. And um, I think it's exciting also. It's, a, it's, a, it's Joe Parker in his prime, who's a terrific heavyweight and a big star right now. I don't know if you followed all his videos during the pandemic, but he really kept his profile high, did a lot of entertainment-related stuff. I think he's in the height of his popularity. And Junior is his biggest foil, you know, in New Zealand. And... Um, and on, you know, an undefeated world ranked heavyweight. So um, let's see if we can get that done. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a heavyweight division is obviously on fire, but underneath, you know, those top three guys right now um, it's, it's uh, there's a ton of contenders and it's going to be interesting, like where that all falls together. Um, the winner of that fight, I mean, Font and, and Parker, um, you know, where do you see those guys fitting into the picture in terms of a title shot? I know, Obviously, we got Fury and Wilder on the books, um, but then Josh was signed for the Fury fight. Um, I think the winner, that fight of that magnitude, the winner would be such a star also in New Zealand in the paper you star in New Zealand. Um, I think the winner of that fight. Would they be would, a mandatory? Um, I don't know if, they, if that fight could be an eliminator of some kind. I don't think it matters if it's a mandatory right now because I don't think anyone's going to block Joshua, I don't think anyone's going to block Wilder and Fury. I don't think anyone's going to block Joshua fighting the winner uh, yeah. down the line. So, but but I do think that the winner of Fa uh, and, and Parker would be guaranteed an enormous, massive fight. Yeah. I and mean, what do you think about another heavyweight matchup? I think that's really interesting is with uh, Usyk and, and Chisora. Um, you know, Usyk obviously moving up to heavyweight. Um, you know, Witherspoon, who I used to promote years and years and years ago, who was long in the tooth when he fought um, Usyk, he didn't expose Usyk because it's clear it was clear from the fight even that Usyk's a superior fighter. He's an excellent boxer, but it was also clear from the fight that Usyk is a small heavyweight. And the question is going to be, how does his size transfer to a, to the top level of competition? Um, I tend to think he has enough skill to beat a Chisora if he doesn't get caught. And I don't think Chisora is like Deontay Wilder or, or, uh, or Fury as a puncher. Um, 
but I think that he certainly is a good test as a bigger heavyweight um, fighting a smaller man. Yeah. Um, I think Usyk. I think Usyk could win a title. I think Usyk could be a, a contender, but my gut tells me that Usyk is a little bit too small to have success with the huge heavyweights. Yeah, Usyk, even in his you know kind of first fight, is welcome to the heavyweight division. He didn't seem like he carried. He definitely doesn't carry that kind of one punch power or real stopping power. He's a tremendous boxer, obviously, um, but I feel like in the heavyweight division to not have, you know, any really stopping power. It seemed like um, it could be a problem, especially for, you know, those top. Yeah. But I could tell you also that certain of the, you know, his style though could be difficult for a while. His style could be difficult for a very difficult for a Joshua. Um, Interestingly, I think Usyk Fury is very, very fast on his feet and very agile for a big, 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 big man. He's very unusual in his style of fighting for a huge man. Um, I think Usyk might be able to compete with Joshua or Wilder if he fights a perfect fight. If, he, if one of those two guys lands a bomb, however, I think it's good night, Usyk. And you think Fury sits at the top right now? It's pretty... How could you think anything else at the moment? You know? Yes, I do. I think he sits at the top. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I would agree. Um, so I'll be interested in the in the trilogy. Obviously, you can never count out Wilder because he does have that, um, you know, the eraser. But we'll see how that plays out. Um, but to touch back on, you know, your love of boxing, but also baseball. Obviously, last night was opening day in the MLB. Um, so what does that mean for, you know, your minor league teams and, and what nothing? Is like? I mean, we're closed down. Yeah. Minor league season's completely closed down. Major league baseball, Manfred's declared war on the minor leagues. We're in all sorts of, you know, ab- not, not my two teams, but 42 teams are going to be eliminated from the minor leagues. There's big issues that are governing how business is going to be conducted with the remaining teams. Um, the situation between the minors and the majors right now is dire and, and we're not, you know, the majors are really trying to squeeze the minor leagues. So it's a very difficult time in baseball too. You know, I, it was very hard for me to watch the, I watched the Yankee game last night. Um, watching a home run hit into empty stands is just weird. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't mind that that sound of like a fastball hitting the glove is a cool sound. A sound of a baseball hitting a sweet spot on the bat is a cool sound. No sound is cooler than 50,000 people cheering at the same time with a ball going over the fence or 50,000 people cheering in a tremendous catch. Um, I miss baseball the way it was meant to be. Um, I'm going to watch because I'm a fan, but I, I got to admit, I thought the product is much, much, much different than an empty room. Um, uh, you know, the first, when we hang up this, I'm turning off my phone for three hours when we hang up the phone because I'm a Met fan. And it's Met opening day, and I'll be watching the Met game. That first pitch at four ten, I'll be I'll be there. What is, so? What is the relationship with uh, you know? You're a Met fan, but obviously some history with the Yankees. Do you hate the Yankees, or is it just a? No, I don't hate the Yankees because I lived in Boston for seven years when I went to college and law school, and I went to a shitload of of uh, of Red Sox games. And I have to admit that even though I like the Red Sox, that when the Yankees played the Red Sox, all the hatred for New York had me rooting for them. So I don't have like the, I don't have that Yankee hate that other team, that other like Met, Met fans have. Um, but I'm a Met fan and, and I'm a San Francisco giant fan because I won three world series rings as the, you know, as the principal uh, owner uh, uh, when, when Richmond um, was a double a team in, in 2010, 12 and 14, the giants won the world series so I have three World Series rings of the same as the players. So I have an affection for the Giants. Um, though I'm not sure the Giants will be our affiliate when we come back to baseball in 2021, I don't know. But I, I've been working with the Giants for over 15 years and got three World Series rings. So I've always had a warm spot for the San Francisco Giants. Too. Yeah, not, not bad to have three rings. But um, if you could explain just to me, uh, you know, I'm just interested in, 
what is that relationship or how does that really work? Um, you know, you're saying like the MLB is really not supporting them. It would, would have to be on a, it have to be a whole other podcast. I can't give you, I couldn't even give you a five or 10 minute answer. Um, it's complicated the way the system has worked forever. But I think right now that there's greed and there's avarice and there's a desire for the major league owners want to own everything and control everything. And I think they almost resent the fact that minor league owners have built something of value. And I, and I really think we need to respect each other and do what's best for baseball and try to create uh, some situation where, where the minor leagues and the major leagues can thrive together as opposed to the major leagues trying to step on us like we're a mat. But um, it would take much longer for me to give you all the explanation. All right, that's fair. Um, another, another topic, um, you know, I'm curious, your, your experience being a promoter, obviously you're close to these fighters. Um, you've had many champions and, and, and some really high profile fights, obviously, that you've been a part of. Um, are there any guys in particular that really stood out to you throughout your career? I know, obviously, with Mickey Ward, and your involvement in the in the fighter that must have been awesome to be able to um, have an influence on telling his story and and he's got such a great one so um, I'd love to hear some comments on that or your well I mean Sergio Martinez was probably the greatest run I had with anybody um, he, no one knew who he was we brought him over here he was in his early 30s already he already was a one legged fighter but he was such a brilliant athlete and a tremendous 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 talent that he had an incredible run for about five years over here. And, and that was memorable. Um, over the years, my work with Gotti um, and Ward, you know, both within HBO and then after I left HBO. Um, look, I mean, when you look at the glory years of HBO, I signed Mayweather to HBO. I signed Lennox Lewis, Riddick Bowe, Evander Holyfield, Pernell Whitaker, Meldrick Taylor, you know, go through the list, uh, Oscar De La Hoya to multiple contracts. Um, I worked with Oscar over the years um you know i i you know i've worked with some of the greatest in the game i i worked with bernard hopkins after i left hbo i i i'm the guy that got him the trinidad fight um when he beat trinidad and he really he really made himself into a superstar that was a good run um no i've been fortunate in my career i've worked with them some great great fighters i had a great run with jermaine taylor you know it ended sadly i think that uh he was affected by habits outside of the ring and maybe also affected by some of the knockouts he suffered inside of the ring. Um, but Jermaine was a great athlete and had a great run. And um, unfortunately, it, it did end badly. Had it not ended badly, it might have ended in the Hall of Fame. And in your time on the, the set of The Fighter, um, like how much were you involved? I didn't, you're an associate producer, correct? Um, on The Fighter, I was associate producer. I wasn't involved that much. Um, you know, I also was a consultant to Southpaw. When yeah. that movie was done, and I and um, I actually had some great experiences on that one. Just chatting, um, you know, the the the, the actors, uh, Gyllenhaal, Jake Gyllenhaal was in that, and um, helped me on. Uh, For, oh, Forrest Whitaker, Forrest was playing a boxing trainer, and he really didn't know a lot about boxing. So I wound up having a bunch of meals with Forrest, explaining to him about how trainers think and their mindset and and all that kind of stuff. So I mean, I've had fun experiences when I've messed around in the in the uh in the acting slash producing realm i had a fun experience doing rocky balboa and it was great working with stallone on that and giving and him giving me the opportunity to to get that kind of exposure but um you know i i've had a good run man uh, i've spent a lot of time <laughs> in boxing and I have some, i've had some fun yeah i mean there's a lot of a lot of different areas um that you've had tremendous success in obviously with baseball and boxing and now um, you know, telling people stories on the film and producing side. So it's a, it's a pretty amazing. Uh... Well, you know, in a lot of ways, though, I think boxing is very much storytelling. Yeah. Like I, I think boxing done the right way is more theatrical, more poetic, more drama than any other sport. I think now that we have these exclusive deals and these exclusive avenues, we're not getting the best storylines and we're not getting the fights and they're not simmering the right way they're not being promoted the right way because of these exclusive deals and i think these exclusive deals have been the ruination of boxing and frankly i think the exclusive deal with hbo and and golden boy that occurred in the 2000s i think that exclusive deal was the beginning of the end for hbo sports and i'm not by the way that's not me attacking golden boy it's just any exclusive deal 
is harmful in, in a sport like boxing. That's a mano a mano or woman against woman kind of sport. These exclusive deals with fighters being exclusive to one avenue or one streaming platform or one television platform, it detracts from the ability to make the biggest and best fights. It results in programming that's inferior and it's really, really hurt boxing. Is there a way to fix that? Is that, is that like what? It's not going to fix until somebody wakes up and changes it. I mean, you, you know, the fucked up part had the zone, the zone done it the right way and not made a stupid deal with Eddie Hearn to come over here and give him, give a billion dollars to a couple of promoters. They could have wrapped up the whole industry with a billion dollars. They could have literally created a UFC. They could have bought top right and probably made a deal with Heyman and made a deal with, with, I mean, they could have taken my company and 10 other you know, mid-range companies with it. And they could have wrapped up the whole industry. If they would have hired me, frankly, not in a capacity as a promoter, tell me to invest my, get rid of my company. And if they would have hired me to run a boxing program, we could have spent that money wrapping up the whole industry. And I think the zone's hold on combat sports and boxing would have been completely different. I think they made a very, very bad initial strategic decision. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, like you said, it's like shit. Like, I wish you could just bring everything together the way the UFC has it. Honestly, their model is. You great. should be able to match any fighter against any fighter, regardless of where they are. And if you're a programming service or a streaming service and you really care about the programming, you really want the best fights, you really care about boxing. Look, boxing's a fucking shit show. We have no commissioner. The ratings organizations are renegades, desperados, and banditos. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, they have no religion. Their ratings mean nothing. They're all politicized. There's a lot of corruption. The whole system of judging is fucked up and, and, and inappropriate. I mean, you know, there are bad decisions constantly. Boxing's been its own worst enemy, which is unfortunate because we're a great product. When done well, we're the sport of kings. Unfortunately, we're a shit show right now. We're not the fucking sport of kings. No, yeah, and a lot of that, you know, the kind of the hope of boxing is really in the heavyweight division right now. It's carrying the sport, I believe, um, with those. With I'll tell you what, there there could be some really great fights in the welterweight division. No, there could be I some agree, really I great agree. fights. And, it's a shark, I mean, you know, but I'm just yeah. saying for the, I'm, I'm not really saying for, like, boxing fans like us. Like, I'm saying more for, you know, the casual fan, the heavyweight. No, the he no there, there was an old saying, and I think it was um, – who was it? It was the old matchmaker from Madison Square Garden in the years of Teddy Brenner, uh, who was the old matchmaker from Madison Square Garden in the glory days of Madison Square Garden boxing. And Teddy Brenner said, as goes the heavyweight division, so goes boxing. And I think that's one of the encouraging things for boxing right now, that there's a strong heavyweight division with some talent also emerging below the top guys. So I think that gives some hope for the future. But I'm very pessimistic until we have a much more open marketplace in boxing. Yeah. And, but to go back to what you said in the welterweight division, like uh, there are some amazing fights that we made. Pacquiao is still a guy that I'm in awe of. And like, he's uh, been rumored. I don't know if you could say there's any legitimacy to him going up to fight at middleweight. Um, I don't want to hear about that. That's fucking ridiculous. I don't want to yeah. hear about that. I don't want to hear about that. Freddie Roach was talking about it. I don't want to hear about yeah. that. I don't want to hear about that. So you think him versus Mikey Garcia is a more, realistic fight? I, yeah, I think that's a much more realistic fight. I think it's a more competitive fight. It's a more interesting fight to me. But you um, don't see him fight for a title against a guy like Spence or Crawford? I mean, I, I wouldn't mind seeing him fight for Spence or Crawford. No, that, that'd be fine also. Um, I think Mikey Garcia would be a good fight. I think, you know, the Keith Thurman fight was a good fight. You know, yeah. I, I, I uh, you know, I, I mean, there's a lot of talent at 47 and 54 that can jump around and fight each other, you know, and, and at least one of the things about the 47 pound division is that even though Crawford is sort of on his own Island, there are a lot of matchups PBC can make at 47 between their own fighters that are world-class matchups. They have a corner on that division. The way right now top rank seems to have a corner on the 140 pound division. Yeah, most definitely. I think there's a lot of great fights to be had in the next few months. Hopefully they can uh, happen. And, um, you know, obviously, Derevchenko, Charlo, and that's September 26th, correct? 
um, going down. So make sure to tune into that, everyone. Um, that's going to be an awesome matchup. Um, Showtime pay-per-view. Showtime pay-per-view. And then, obviously, we got the Tyson fight coming up in September as well, um, which will be a show. But there's a lot of great fights, great current matchups on the way as well, uh, hopefully by the end of year or fall. Um, Lou, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. It's been awesome just to talk to you, hear a little bit about your story. Um, you're such a presence. Well, I, I, awesome I'm a big, proponent of, a big proponent of anything attached to Brooklyn. <laughs> so if you're the Brooklyn Boxing Podcast, you know, I'm with you, boy. That, that, awesome. That's my hometown. I mean, I grew up in Brooklyn, and you know, I'm sitting here in my uh, my den in Long Island, but uh, but I'm a Brooklyn boy. And, uh, you know, w w where are you right now? Are you in Brooklyn as you, we do this interview? Uh, I'm in South Carolina, actually, right now. So I um, – thankfully, my, my parents are down south here, and, um, you know, I was living in Brooklyn and got here – Pretty recent. Well, I can tell you that it's probably a lot more comfortable at the moment in South Carolina. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely less, less craziness, so it's, it's good to be down here. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm dying to see New York City get back to its old self at some point. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's sad to watch New York City where it is right now, um, even though we're, we're having a good time at the moment with the virus controlling it. Um, it's just driving through Manhattan and, and seeing everything still closed down and you know, I think the reason we're doing well, unfortunately, is because everything is closed down. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping for the best. I'm, I'm sort of this uh, this version of New York is just very depressing to me. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm with you. Hopefully it bounces back. And, and, you know, obviously I'm excited to hopefully get back to the city soon and watch some of these fights. So thanks. Thanks, Lou, again. Um, everyone go follow Lou on social media and Twitter, Instagram. At Lou DiBella. I'm, 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 Twitter is me. The Instagram, <laughs> my company sort of runs occasionally. I mess around on it, but Twitter is me for all its politics and everything else. Also, <laughs> it's at Lou DiBella on Twitter. And uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, Lou. Take care.